right, folks, welcome in. Super excited to have you all here. We are going to be talking about AI and the future of grant funding. So I'm just going to go ahead and throw this up here. Now, if you're just joining us, um, just a little bit of housekeeping. You're in the right spot. This is the Open Grants webinar on AI and the future of grant funding. And just a little bit of housekeeping items as you all trickle in. We're going to give folks a few minutes to come through. Um, so those who are like opening up the emails and clicking on the link and getting in the door. Um, in the meantime, our show today, our webinar today is going to start off with a bit of a fireside chat. Um, and then we're going to move to a uh, question and answer period for y'all. We do have the chat um, itself uh, shut um, for these webinars for everyone's safety and comfort. Um, but you can use the QA tool um, and please do submit answers through the QA for myself um, or our esteemed guest here, Mitko. So we're super excited to have an expert on, on AI who's building one of the coolest companies, I think, uh, in this space. And we'll get into that in a minute. Uh, but yeah, just wanted to welcome everyone here. My name is Sidel Trubovsky. I'm the CEO and co-founder here at Open Grants, and this webinar is called AI and the Future of Grant Funding. We're going to talk a bit about AI and how it's impacting this space. Um, and so just a little bit of background, um, myself and the team here at Open Grants, we specialize in doing a couple of things. We connect folks to grant funding, and we connect folks to technical assistance. And so on the Open Grants platform, um, you can find both grants as well as those folks who can support you, specialists who can support you in your journey to secure grant funding, write grant uh, applications, those kinds of things. So super excited to have you all here. Thanks again for joining. Once again, my name is Sidel Trubovsky. I'm the CEO and co-founder here at Open Grants, and I'm super excited to be joined by Miko. He is the CEO, C, uh, founder. Uh, are you CTO, CEO? Anyways, he is one of the... Yeah. <laughs> one of the founders of Pioneer, which is a super cool company. I'm going to let him introduce himself a little bit uh, and uh, a little bit of his background. Thank you, Sadeo. Thanks for the introduction. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. So Sadeo is like a great uh, friend and supporter of Pioneer. He has been for a while. So I'm really excited to be uh, chatting with you about some of the stuff we've been talking, you know, separately, but now in a broader forum. So yeah, my name is Mitko. I officially Dimitri, but I go by Mitko. And then I'm the founder and CEO of Pioneer. And at Pioneer, we are an early stage company. Uh, and our mission is to coordinate the funding for rapid decarbonization of our economy. Uh, and we do that, that by helping companies apply for non dilutive funding, such as government grants and contracts, but also non-governmental sources. Um, so I also have a extensive background in AI and software development. Uh, and so happy to talk about how, uh, basically, what's happening right now in the AI space, and then how does that relate to grants uh, and other non dilutive applications. Awesome. Yeah. And thank you so much for joining us. I, you know, you've been studying AI literally for years, uh, like tens of years, right? Um, and I, I, one of the questions I had that I was just thinking and thinking a lot about is, you know, at least for me, someone who is not super technical, you know, this whole thing, you know, there's AI was always out there, but then all of a sudden it seemed like it was like, you know, there was just been this explosion with generative AI. Um, and I just w wanted to get your perspective on like where we are uh, in terms of technology development, because, you know, we, we see this technologies progress over time that become more ubiquitous mm -hmm. and then they get adopted by everybody. And there's that, you know, there's that classic adoption curve that we, that we've all seen. Um, wh where do you think we are in that curve as it relates to AI? Is this like, is this a special moment we're experiencing or is this sort of just like business as usual as technology develops and evolves? It's a fantastic question. So I've been, I uh, just wanted to just share a little bit about my background about so people can know how much to trust my opinion about AI. But I've been, uh, I did my master's in MIT more than 10 years ago. And at that point I was doing natural language uh, for robot manipulation of objects. And at that point, neural network were considered like a failed approach. And later on, deep learning came up and a recurring neural networks and now the transformer architecture. So I also was a Twitter at some of their data science machine learning team where I helped build what is known as the algorithm. So I've had I had some practical experience as well. There's obviously people like Andre Karpati that are way more out there. So I wouldn't say I'm the biggest expert, but I have enough to to share some you know interesting thoughts and um 
to a question like, is this business usual? So I'd like to think about it. Is this an incremental AI improvement or is there actually like a big step function here? Um, and one of the very exciting and interesting architectures for AI right now uh, is transformers. And even before we go into that, I wanted to talk about like AI, the, word, the phrase AI has been around for decades. It means many, many different things. So when I talk about AI today, I will specifically talk about large language models or LLMs. I'm going to use these two interchangeably. Um, and then I, I might say just traditional AI or classical AI when I'm referring to the broader. And so in terms of LLMs, um, they, they're mainly based on the transformer architecture. And what, what is very exciting about its transformer architecture is that it's much more like a computer than a calculator. The a lot of the previous models are very optimized for a specific purpose. So it's like doing a calculator, it can do addition, subtraction, certain statistical uh, pattern matching. Whereas transformers, they act much more like a computer. They can iterate, they can do more complex tasks. And we're seeing that with GPT-4. And so they have much more expressive power. And actually, theoretically, this is well understood in uh, theory of computation. They are Turing complete. And that is very, very exciting to me. That actually um, made me a lot more excited about what's going on. Um, because right now, if we think of LLMs, we can think of them as a programming language that is now accessible to people that are not just software engineers, but anybody uh, who knows English language and can be precise in what they want to achieve. Um, and also, the transformer architecture has been around for close to, I think, six years plus. Uh, so it's been very exciting to see that and follow that, but it hasn't been accessible. Today, we are at an inflection point starting like sometime last fall when ChatGPT launched, and that became um, the price point and accessibility and the user interface became much more easy to access to broad set of people. So now a lot of people are starting to learn about prompt engineering and other techniques. So I would say, yes, there is a specific inflection point and um, I can talk more about that later, but it's it becomes a great platform for innovation. Awesome. No, this is, that is super exciting. It's definitely, you know, something we've experienced here. You know, when we launched Open Grants, we had these ideas about how we were going to transform how people write grants and access grant funding. Mm -hmm. And frequently we just came up against the fact that it was a little cost prohibitive to do some of the things that you can do like on a weekend now. Um, <laughs> so uh, yeah, there's a, there's definitely, you know, we've seen a change here and it's interesting to, to hear that um, from you as well. Um, you know, I, I thought one of the things we could start out with today before we dive into the specifics of grants is just like high level, you know, since we have you here, mm -hmm. um, high level, there's a lot of orgs. I'm sure there's startups and, and other groups on the on the webinar today um, who are probably interested in integrating these tools. And I just wanted to get your thoughts, you know, as as everyone's thinking about AI and like maybe getting a little FOMO, like are we being left behind or should we even like use this? And we'll get into that later. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what are some thoughts that you have, like just practical advice for folks who are looking to integrate AI solutions into their into their workflows or into their product offering, um, any any like pointers you could give folks um, who are thinking about like, all right, well, how do I take advantage of all this cool stuff? Yeah, so great question. So I'll just break that into two parts. One is like, if you're trying to use some kind of a tool and want to bring in an AI tool, I would just say, just think about it like any other tool and evaluate on those dimensions. AI is like, like I said, it's like a programming language. So if a tool is built with a better programming language, why would you care as a customer? You know, at the end of the day, you care about does it solve your problem? Is it easy to use? Is it uh, what is the user experience? What is the price? All of those other parameters. Um, and there is an interesting uh, point with to be made with AI power tools is a lot of them are thin wrappers around ChatGPT or some equivalent system with with a better user experience. Um, one other thing to be very careful. I would say just be very careful about this, understanding the data privacy protection, reading the terms of service, because one of the dangers is if you're using any kind of proprietary company data there, um, you want to make sure that it's not going to be used to train the generic model that now everybody can use. This is just as good as like publishing your data out on social media uh, in terms of probably legal privacy. And this is something we've been taking very uh, carefully at Pioneer, creating like a 
rigorous customer data protection policy with our customers. Um, and from the other part of the question, like if you're a company that's looking to, and you have a product and you're looking to integrate uh, LLMs into your solution, you probably already have looked at it and uh, done something about it already. But yeah, I would say like making sure that the data privacy as well, um, and then looking at how can you scale the capabilities and integrate and how can you be actually um, innovative there. I think that's a really big challenge because it's often uh, there's a bit of a design, you design a product around a specific use case and maybe just thinking about, maybe I can ask you like, what do you think the future is gonna be? But it's gonna be interesting to just think about the future and what happens when we have products that are just completely inspired by the use cases and the possibilities of AI. I don't think we see that many um, product out there. Um, Often they are uh, something very still to you, but I'm excited to see something that's like completely AI, you know, LLM native uh, still. Yeah, that's awesome. I love it. Great advice. I think, yeah. you know, just pragmatically approaching these things. Um, and, you know, it is at the end of the day a tool and should be uh, evaluated as such. So uh, great advice. I think what we'll do, um, let's get into... Uh, let's get into grants and the future of grant funding. We'll, we will maybe take a, a step back and, and circle back to more of like AI and the future and some of your outlooks there. But um, I'm super excited to talk about, you know, first high level, you know, what Pioneer is and what y'all are doing. Um, and then talk a little bit about, um, you know, just like how you see this impacting the future of grant making. But can you give us, you know, high level, what's Pioneer? Why, why is it exciting or why should people be excited about it? Yeah, like I said before, Pioneer mission is to coordinate the funding for rapid decarbonization of the economy. And we have companies identify, apply, and later on comply with uh, various different types of awards and bids. Um, and we realize this is a big, messy process that requires a lot of project management, document preparation, uh, decision-making in a group setting, a bunch of related to business development and sales. So uh, we want, we realize that if we just build like a standalone tool, that's only going to solve like a very small subset of those problems. And so the way we set a pioneer is much more like a, from the point of view of a customer, it's, it's more like a tech company that is dressed up like a consultancy from the point of view of customer. And so we want to, that allows us to actually address the bigger challenges and keep on iterating, really solving the big important problems that are most valuable for customers, things where their hair is on fire, um, and one thing we realized, uh, especially with the grant making space and grant writing, there's a bunch of like really amazing people, but there's just not enough people who want or can do this type of work. Uh, and so we want to help scale the workforce and give really super power, uh, super, uh, super powers to those who can or want to do it. I love that. Yeah, it's that's definitely something you know, I, folks within our ecosystem struggle a lot with scaling technical assistance, which is what we call it, but like, you know, the work of grant writing and strategic support. And this is one of the reasons, and, you know, as uh, as you alluded to earlier, I'm, you know, personally a huge fan of Pioneer. I've also contributed some, some resources in that direction, full disclosure, but the reason I'm so excited and like have gotten involved with Pioneer is because of this. This is a, it's a super cool point that you bring up of giving these really smart, uh, talented folks who have developed this very niche Kind of capability of operating in the like the grants and government space uh superpowers is just so exciting to me uh because they always you know i i worked in that space for some time and saw how overworked and like uh, you know maxed out on bandwidth all these folks were um who were building and doing these really cool things and so it's very exciting um very cool i'd love to talk a little bit more about just you know uh, if you have any examples of like uh, what you've all been into, just to give like, you know, just to give yep. folks more of a concrete taste of like what Pioneer does. Yeah, uh, one example is, um, I think one of the first thing we built internally that was actually, like I said, it's also a thin wrapper around all the LLM models is draft generator. So we work with our customers that we work with, usually there's a company at Series A, but we also have worked with publicly traded companies uh, to help them apply for awards. And usually what we do is we bring some of their documents and contents and we're able to use that as a base for enough context so that our language models can use that. And one of the things, the first things we did is 
for the draft generator, right? And so that allows people who are doing grant writing instead of spending a lot of time on like figuring out how to wordsmith all the all the text, they can get a really great starting point, and that can save a significant amount of time, specifically in the writing stage. Um, there's a bunch of other um, projects that we have underway, uh, but things like processing the funding opportunities announcements of the RFPs and extracting the requirements, also matching them with that uh, body of content for each customer and figuring out what are the most best qualified opportunities, uh, generating the right strategy. And also it is a big coordination challenge. So you want to coordinate in the, usually you might have seen that sometimes the writing of the grant is a bunch of the work, but it's not necessarily the hardest work. Sometimes it is pulling out the information out of the applicant and getting them a buy-in about the approach you want to do. Because at the end of the day, it is they're the final decision maker who owns the application. Their name is signed on the dotted line. So they have you have to get their buy-in. And I think sometimes that involves actually multiple people on their end. So a lot of coordination. And that's why as a part of our mission, the first word is coordinating for rapid the funding for rapid decommunization. There's a lot of tasks to coordinate there. Yeah, 100 percent And that's you know, once again, this is super exciting. I think you know, we'll get into this a little bit later, but you know, some of the most important work that I saw or that we engaged in as strategists and consultants in this space was often that, right? Like grant grant writing is just sort of this after the fact uh, activity to like communicate all this stuff you learned, um, especially if you're a consultant, but it's not uh, it's not really the core activity. It's just a byproduct of, of the activity that you did. And uh, that's super exciting. I want to encourage the audience because I just saw one come in. Please do feel free. We will open it up for a Q&A, but feel free to use the Q&A tool while we're speaking to send us any questions you might have. Um, would love to love to address those. So please do chime in. Um, I want to get into uh, more of this like, all right, what does this mean for the future? So we've talked about AI at large. We've talked a bit about what Pioneer is. Um, and one of the reasons that I'm super excited about it is I do think you know, it's this kind of thing is the key to accelerating deployment of capital for underserved communities, uh, for climate, for many other things across the board, uh, just because one of the core constraints that's been very visible in the industry is uh, a lack of scalable TA and really like those service providers who can help you mm -hmm. strategize and do all the things you're talking about. But, you know, I, I would love to get your take on this because you know, it's something, I think it's an uncomfortable thing that sometimes we we struggle with when we talk about like the future of this is like some people feel very protective about, <laughs> about their roles. Other people are more, you know, open to embracing this, but this really has been, this work has been the domain of like specific subject matter experts for a long time. There's a whole cottage industry uh, built around it in consultants wise. Um, how do you think about like the future of this, of this space and, um, you know, how do you see the role of those subject matter experts and consultants involved evolving uh, as technology like this develops? Yeah, uh, like I said, we want to empower them with superpowers. We have a internally, we call it the Iron uh, Man, Iron Woman suit that we're building or like a Formula One race car. So we want to actually make that job a lot more fun and also bring that to the high level of strategy, project management, reducing a lot of the cognitive load uh, for the applicant. Um, and making their job become now the trusted source of information, right? Because like at the end of the day, the final customer will probably not want to uh, fully trust any kind of software tool. They want to always have a person they want to talk to, right? And a grant consultant or grant writer, their job would be keep the, the final customer applicant accountable for all the things they have to do, uh, but also act as that this is a big waiting source of information for them. Just like I might be asking ChatGPT for some high level legal advice and explain to me how certain things work. But at the end of the day, I might want to always just ask my lawyers for when I have to do something with high stakes and grant and contract application is incredibly high stakes. So um, I'll be actually excited for uh, increasing and elevating the status of this job and profession. Uh, because we think we can actually increase the value that each of those people bring, and then um, that will come with increase in status and earning potential. Awesome. Yeah, no, I, I think that uh, that's great. Um, I wonder if you could talk through any, um, 
you know, I think there's a lot of opportunities for people that, you know, we, we talked a little bit about um, just, you know, the ubiquity of this technology and the accessibility. Um, and I'd love, you know, I'm happy to give one example. Uh, you know, we've worked on some pretty cool things. If you want to like test this out, if you're an entrepreneur um, and just see where like the bits and pieces are, like, you know, you can go and access GPT or Claude or any of the many of the models for free. Um, and you can write queries um, and, you know, ask them, ask them questions. Um, and I just wonder, uh, you know, as you see like these models develop and different applications for the industry, um, do you think that, that, do you have any, any pointers for like consultants um, who are trying to like get into this space or, or for, for founders who are just like, want to go out and explore uh, any thoughts mm -hmm. on like what model to use over, over a different one? Like, you know, I, I know you've been, and maybe, maybe you don't have any thoughts on that, but I know you've been looking at this space for a while. Any, any thoughts on like which ones are performing best or where's the best place to like, just start your search and start experimenting? Yeah, definitely. I would say at the moment that GPT-4 uh, is the best model and, what makes it the best is the ability to actually follow instructions much more accurately than the previous generations. And I think that's very important. Uh, and then actually, we, that's the main one we are using internally for a lot of our systems. And that allows us to have much higher quality of output with a lot less engineering effort put behind it. Um, I want to flag one of the fundamental limitations for a lot of those models is the context length, namely how much uh, text you can put uh, additional context for the model to know what you're talking about. Um, and usually that's like a few thousand uh, words. So it's not a huge amount. Um, and I think that's that's really where those models are really trained to have the attention within that period. And so uh, it, trying to extend that beyond like working with like an infinite, quote, 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 unquote, infinite amount of knowledge, or just like unbounded amount of knowledge. That is one of the challenges that we're also trying to work towards. Uh, in terms of, so other models, Claude specifically, they have the 100,000 uh, token context, which actually is significantly larger than GPT-4, but I haven't actually ex extensively, super extensively tested it, but uh, the understanding is it's not at that full level as well. So I would consider using Claude for larger if you have to pull in a lot more of the FOA uh, text in there um, and using GPT-4 in other cases. Yeah, awesome. Great, great insights. Um, well, this is really cool. I, I, I would want to just still flag the ability to like making sure that the data is not going to be used by open AI to train their models because you might be working with very sensitive IP data from the customers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's some there's some cool uh, innovations happening around, you know, retrieval augmented generation and, and mm -hmm. other approaches um, to like help you you know, keep some of that data in place. But yeah, you know, all good, all good considerations for folks looking to dive into this space. Um, I, I think, uh, you know, one of the things that I think is really cool, Open Grants has this thesis of, you know, we think one, like obviously grant writing is this, it's a, a communications exercise, right? Mm -hmm. You're taking all this info that you've derived from either your company or, or other places and you're synthesizing it into a document and you're like sending it to a funder. And, you know, one of the things that AI does really well um, is, you know, helping create those documents. And then also, uh, you know, there's the possibility and capability on the other side of the table to use AI to, to understand those pieces of information. Um, yeah. I, I, you know, our thesis is like very soon, we don't think that people will be writing grants as much as you'll just be like transmitting data. Um, and so, you know, we always encourage folks to get really good at, at storytelling, to understand, you know, the reason they're telling the stories and how the like the impacts and implications of the data and impacts they're having relate to the funders. Because at the end of the day, you're just trying to find funders who have the same goals as you, right? Whether that be climate or cancer research or mm -hmm building new technology for war fighters. It's all like, there's people out there who are trying to fund it, you know? And so um, I'd love to get your thoughts on, you know, the role that you see Pioneer playing, but also just overall, you know, your reaction to that. Um, do you think that's yeah. possible in the next 
like a couple of years? Where where do you think we where do you think we're headed uh, when it comes to this technology and as it relates to specifically the like the act of communicating for grant funding? Yeah, first of all, I, lo I love that vision. I'll be skeptical if I think it will have gonna happen in a couple of years. I would say maybe in a decade the chances are bigger, just the way the speed with the with which government is moving. But I think yeah, a lot of the communication could be a lot more simplified, right? It's still a useful exercise if you're applying for grants to kind of get your narrative straight, like you said. Um, but I think that can happen in a much more efficient way. Um, one thing that we've noticed and heard is the way that actually the government grades those application is already very robotic, right? So they hire sometimes volunteers and they tell them, these are exactly the steps you have to follow. And even when you write, uh, you know, response letters you have to use this very robotic style so they leave almost no room, room for creativity and that's actually a test that is like very well handled by uh, a lot of those language models and so i would hope that the government actually improves that uh, and while maintaining fairness uh, as well so however we didn't want to start by selling to the government about that so that's why we started with the, with yeah. the companies and then as a part of that we've been trying to figure out what is the way to score the applications and the drafts and the and the package so far. So that is something that is going to evolve on our end. Um, but I also wanted to flag like one common misconceptions people might have about a lot of those like AI models that sometimes tend to make up stuff. And so some people thought like, oh, if we use those uh, models to help us write the applications, it, is there going to be a flood of uh, low quality applications? And I think that is actually uh, very soluble and actually a lot of those models and tools they help companies express and communicate their stuff much more effectively right so they already have the base content the research the product that they built and so this is more of a communication tool like when I was at one of my first job uh, they wanted to create a patent so I spoke to a patent lawyer for a little more than an hour and they came back few years late, a few weeks later with 15 20 pages of patent style application, which I wouldn't know half of the words there, but those are the right words to use in that context. So we're hoping that a lot of that application would be something like that. And, and even if we dare to dream further, what if we actually flip the whole communication uh, process on its head and instead of you know applicants today applying for grants, what if the grants and the funding sources apply directly to the applicant and say, we think you might be a good it might be a good fit for us to give you money for that. Um, and that happens a little bit to some degree where some companies can get invited to apply. Um, but we think that that might be like even an interesting thought to consider. Yeah, no, we love that. You know, our bit of our mission has always been focused on making this whole ecosystem more accessible and equitable. Mm -hmm. um, I do want, there's some really good questions in here. So I, I would love to dive into some of these. Yeah, I just wanted to maybe just say like, I would expect that, even though it becomes a more efficient communication exercise, it might be more efficient on the human level and interfacing with it. But I would actually imagine the packages, the application packages will actually become much more comprehensive and, and even larger. Uh, I think it's just a pattern we've seen with any time we can optimize the process, that process tends to become bigger as well. Yeah, 100%. Um, I love, uh, there's a good one. There's a really good question here. Um, and I think people will be very interested in this. Um, so. Uh, there's a question. Can we get, can you get more info into, uh, in, can you get more into using chat GPT for writing grants? Um, and yeah, I think, yeah, this is, uh, there's a, there's a lot of opportunities. We touched on this briefly and I'd love to get your, your thoughts, Miko, but, um, you know, one of the things that's been really exciting is just the rise of like, first of all, you can go and get like, you know, you can sign up for, uh, OpenAI's GPT, you can get the plus version for like 20 bucks a month. It's super cheap. Um, mm -hmm. And you can do a lot of really cool things there. Um, I've actually done some experiments where I just like built prompts to say, hey, you know, you're a PhD researcher um, applying for uh, an NIH grant, respond to the questions. And then I just like yeah. respond. And then I put the questions in from the grant and, you know, it, it wrote everything from a data management plan to, uh, you know, um, you know, like a research, you know, uh, a research proposal. Um, so there's a lot of ways to like 
leverage the technology out there to do these cool things. Uh, obviously, there's limitations, as you mentioned. Um, but I think this is like, you know, this is a great opportunity to, uh, it, it depends on where you're starting, I think, off, often, like if you know how to use a tool uh, or or not, if you're very familiar with this process, I think, you know, some of these basic tools can be really useful. Um, but, you know, we'd love to get your thoughts on like, how can, you know, say, say you're someone on this, on this call, who's like, just really interested in like, using some of these models to start writing grants or to improve your, your workflows, any thoughts on like, best places to start, um, just to like, get your, you know, dip your toes in the water and then learn more? Yeah, excellent question. So actually, this is one of the first things we started with, uh, before even like doing much of the product, we were actually using ChatGPT directly. Obviously there's like some settings you have to configure there about history and using data for training purposes. But once you do that, uh, and, and even like helped uh, some of our customers to run the grant directly using that process. Um, and what I found myself doing was, uh, instead of actually worried about the actual word smithing and fitting within word limits, I was able to think much more about what is the narrative, what are the main points they're trying to make and then Edit, edit, basically effectively start by editing the application on that level. So I would encourage everyone to, to just start using it right away. I think it's going to save you a lot of time. Uh, it's available. It's, you know, it's effectively free. Uh, if you get the plus version, you have access to really, uh, really solid models. It's going to save you a lot of time. So I think it's, it's a no brainer if you're in the space to start using that as a base system and understand, um, what are the capabilities and, there's certain things that it fails right now at, unless you're very good at prompting, because it it can have a bit of more of a politician style answer, which says a bunch of words that don't mean anything. So you have to say, be concise, be very factual, and it's still not going to do always a great job, especially if it doesn't have the right content in this context, know about what you actually need to say. Um, so that is one of the challenges that we find with some of the answers there that they can be a bit more high level, blah, blah, blah responses instead of very factual, precise, concise, uh, which actually uh, helps with application quality. Yeah, no, that's great. I think, um, uh, and we're getting some great, great kind of follow on questions. And I just want to bring up, you know, one experiment that we did at Open Grants um, is uh, we used uh, Zapier recently dropped a, a new tool mm -hmm. called Interfaces. Um, uh, that uses, uh, I believe it's retrieval augmented generation where basically, you know, you can say, all right, I want you to use the model GPT to like do the math, but I want you to pull from like a specific data set that I've curated for you. Um, and then you can build up, you can build a model to like, you know, start to talk specifically maybe to your subject matter expertise. Um, and that's a little, I mean, you, you have to obviously pay to use that tool, but um, I think there's so many cool opportunities and the more, the more I see and like play with the different tools that are out there, um, you know, the better idea I get about like, okay, this might be useful for this kind of job. Um, but I definitely am starting to develop an idea of like, oh, you know, some of these like tools need to be very purpose built for very specific things. Whereas mm -hmm. for like general stuff, maybe GPT by itself is great. Um, I'm going exactly. to- Yeah, and I think we are building this kind of purpose to a systems around it. Like I said, Zapier, there's like a lot of systems to get right, specifically optimized for this mind. Yeah. Um, uh, I think it's an interesting following language, a question about, uh, I think Juan asked about uh, how can you adjust the style ChatGPT to his own uh, narrative style? Uh, if you want to paraphrase this, I'm a big fan of ChatGPT and uh, using yeah, it yeah. Yeah. with my grants. I have a thread where I have uploaded language from previous grants I wrote. Um, and can you share some tips to make it more effective to capture and keep my content down language? Um, and is ChatGPT forward a 20 month investment? So yes, the the last question, yes, is definitely worth it, especially that helps you be more effective at your job. Um, and then tips for being more effective. Uh, and capturing your own uh, content tone and language. I would say that still depends on the amount of context, but you can say uh, it's really a lot of that stuff becomes about prompt engineering, and that becomes a challenge. One thing that we're developing like 
new techniques around that, but you you have to then explicitly tell ChatGPT, this is my style, um, and now answer this thing in this style, and maybe explain more about what this style is. So you have to, one mental model I have about ChatGPT is like, it's a really good, fast intern, but it's not like a super strong specialist. So it's an intern knows a lot about stuff, but you have to explain very clearly what you want. And I think that's what we're seeing with prompt engineering, a lot of that, um, a lot of techniques there are coming up. Awesome. Now that's, those are great insights. Being, being explicit rather than implicit is always helpful. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, um, Melinda, you asked which one, please text name. Um, I think you might've been asking about like the different models. Um, if you can just maybe throw, uh, Melinda, if you could throw like a uh, follow on into the, into the chat to just clarify, we would love to address that. Um, let's see. Oh, there's a grant strategy question here. Um, so I'll just I'll just answer this one real fast. Uh, I want to make use of foundation segmentation models based on visual transformers fine tuned on public medical imaging data. Um, how would I get started on a grant strategy? Great question. Uh, honestly, you know, folks like NSF and NIH would both be probably super interested. Um, there's a, a lot of really great tools out there that could help you start matching to grants and building a funnel so that you could then start applying for grants. Um, I'd definitely sign up for the Pioneer waitlist. They are super in demand these days, but um, you could go to Open Grants. You can sign up for free there. We'll start matching you to grants. It's all it's all free, um, and we can get you connected to to other folks. Um, so, yeah, just um, you know, in terms of building a grant strategy around developing AI, uh, there's a quite a few public agencies um, that are interested in funding this kind of work right now. Um, so definitely dive in um, and, uh, you know, get started. Uh, that's the best way to do it is get started, build that funnel, figure out like, all right, here's the universe, the possible, start to understand like which ones are uh, going to be really relevant for you and then start applying. Um, and you can use some of the tools and suggestions that we've outlined here to maybe streamline that process. Um, and I think there's another, there's another great question here um, that kind of dovetails nicely. That's more on the AI side too. Um, question is, how will AI be able to support fundraising professionals with identifying relevant grant opportunities, i.e. like, you know, doing that prospecting and building that funnel? Um, this is a great question. Uh, we certainly have some thoughts um, and some things here at Open Grants, but I don't know, Miko, if you uh, want to throw anything out there about how y'all are thinking about this, but I can definitely chat about this as well. <laughs> Yeah, and I, and I think this has become like an area of overlap. And I think this is where we worked with Open Grants before uh, using Open Grants' API to help us uh, identify what is, you know, help us with the search process. Um, but really, if you think about it, like what is a great way to qualify if a certain grant uh, or other uh, just fundraising opportunity is relevant? And uh, there's like a bunch of factors. Some of the factors like, what is the general information of the company, but also like what is the available database of uh, grants. And Open Grants have an amazing database. So we've been working with that, um, but then you still have to like filter through that and match in a very deep level, each of the possible opportunities. And sometimes you have to look at the eligibility requirements. Um, you have to look at also what are the company priorities and timeline, internal timeline, what else is gonna be there. So. That's where we see a lot of those uh, flexible language model allow us to actually program our way into saying, being able to evaluate and look through much more deeply to a lot of uh, various opportunities. And I know like Open Grants has been building something to help narrow that process as well. Yeah, no, that's that's great. And I, you know, so a little bit more on this, uh, Molly, it's a great question. Um, one of the ways that we've been approaching this is we used vectorized, we use vectorized data. Um, and so we'll look at the text kind of qual content of somebody who's saying, hey, I'm doing a project, for example, um, that's direct carbon capture. Um, and they'll, you know, we'll have them submit a few paragraphs, two or three about their project, what they're building, why they're building it. Um, and then we'll include other data like location and what kind of entity they are. Mm -hmm. So there's basic filtering that can be done. And this is that's really just the job of software, right, is, OK, are you a are you a nonprofit? Well, then you're, you know eligible for these grants that are also for nonprofits. Um, what we try to do though, is think a little bit beyond that because we do, you know, we think grant funding should be about the outcomes and not about like your tax ID. Um, so there's different like tools we can suggest, uh, but 
the core of our matching is really around the spectrized uh, embedding. So we'll say, all right, well, the text of this is super similar to the text of this grant for direct, you know, carbon capture. Um, and so that's how, you know, what we show to our users at Open Grants um, is if you type in a, a profile and create a profile and, and we run that against our database, we'll say, all right, well, this is a 98% match. This is a 70% match. Um, and so it is really useful in terms of building that initial funnel of the possible and then starting to evaluate. And I think the next step and what we're really excited about is also, uh, especially for programs with a lot of history, is looking at all of the historical winners uh, of those programs and then comparing your project to those who have been historically awarded and giving you kind of a confidence score. Um, and so I think that's, you know, that's a feature um, that I think will be forthcoming um, a capability uh, that we're very interested in. Um, and uh, yeah, so I, you know, at a high level for fundraisers, it's just like really streamlining uh, all of the work that you're doing. Um, and then, you know, down the road, I think it could even help you with, um, you know, evaluating individual opportunities. Um, let's see, some more questions. Oh, a great question from Justin. Um, we're going to get into this a little bit later, but I'd love to touch on it now. Um, and I'll throw this one to you first, Miko, and then I'll follow up. Uh, what comments do you have about the ethical use of AI tools for grant writing, i.e. using chat B GPT and writing grants, meanwhile being mindful of data sets and confidential information? Yeah, I can mention a few times just being mindful about is the data leaking to any sub processor? Very, very important to, uh, because that means being ethical to your customer, to the applicant, right? Uh, there is also the question of being ethical towards the system in general and to those agencies and uh, to what degree you need to disclose whether you're using certain tools uh, and not to help you with. Uh, and people have been using a lot of tools to help them with the writing process. And I think what would be, I would, I would consider an ethical is just uh, putting the output of the AI models kind of vanilla without any uh, post-processing and being verified by human. I think that would be probably an ethical because the, there might be what people call hallucinations in the model. Um, those are becoming more and more rare, but you want to always double check a human and sign off as a human that this is you're standing behind every word there. Uh, so I would say just being careful about that aspect and being, being careful not to misrepresent any information that you actually have, but being um, using AI as a tool to just more effectively communicate the actual information and sort that you know. Um, so I would say that is that is one of the ethical concerns that we've we've heard about. And actually, I'm bullish that applications written with the help of extra tools will be higher quality and easier for the agencies to actually process and evaluate. So I'm hoping we can actually make it a positive ethics case there as well over time. Yeah, I I agree with that. I think you know one of the things we're excited about on the sort of like ethics and equity side is. You know, I, I mean, I'll just give a concrete example. I have a friend who, you know, is quite dyslexic and has struggled his whole professional career to write emails. And now with AI, he can like communicate much clearer and, and has a much easier time of doing that. Um, and so I do think this will like, you know, GPT and others will really streamline, open up access for folks who are trying to apply for grants. Uh, but certainly, you know, you want to be mindful not only of like, how the model arrived at its capabilities and like what kind of things it ingested along the way. Um, but also, you know, how you're using that and representing those outputs to the world as, as you mentioned. So yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to add like, especially around the, this kind of like area of justice and availability, there's like a related ethics question about more like a systemic question of who actually gets to win most of the grants and funding. Uh, and there's been a bunch of stats about number of small businesses able to compete for grants has decreased. And then uh, the concentrate there's been like increasing concentration within like you know radius around DC, the highway bandits, uh, beltway bandits. So we want to actually we think there's like a ethics violation at the moment of or just systemically the system is not really creating that uh, justice and fairness. And so we want to actually. One one thing that I'm excited about those AI tools and uh, all of you uh, grant writers here in the audience being able to use ChatGPT and help more cust customers more effectively, um, that is actually going to increase the fairness of representation and meritocracy around applicants. And one thing that yeah, I think if we can increase the 
actual merit of the applicants, then the system will be more effective and it will grow. Yeah, that's great. I love that vision. Um, well, just a quick pioneer question here. What industries and what industry sectors and subsectors have you had the most engagement with for your AI grant writing tools? Great question and thank you. So we've been focusing on uh, climate tech because it's part of our mission to decarbonize. But even within that, we've been working with some battery tech company, logistics devices company, um, and also EV companies. And right now, we are quite interested in the optimize our offering around. Um, but yeah, all around uh, just climate tech, innovative climate tech. That's where we're, we're that's our idea set of customers, and that's where we get most of engagement. Uh, we're less focused on developers who you know create like large uh, solar installations and stuff like that, because that's a bit more deployment stage. We're also just naturally excited to be helping people that are very innovative, very creative, uh, at least as um, early customers. Awesome. Um, do you have any recommendations for the best best places to start if you're based in the UK? Would you recommend Chat GPT or or another option? I think I already know the answer, but uh, go for it. <laughs> yeah, I would say yeah, Chat GPT as well. Uh, and I, I'm not. Yeah, I think EU has a lot of. So we are a pioneer. We focus on the USA market, so I can't talk in too much detail about the EU market. But and actually, UK is now is not specifically in EU. Uh, after Brexit, but a lot of the grants in EU are now um, based on uh, just English-based language. So I think that makes it very much easier to search as well. Awesome. Um, let's see, another question here. How can I leverage AI for technical development pitches suitable for investors? Thoughts? Uh, yeah, one of the things we've been using just on the side, we always like to just experiment with new tools. Uh, there's one called Beautiful AI, which you can just sign up. And we've been using that for some of the uh, deck presentations that we use sometimes when we have to communicate to our customers. So that is one idea, one pointer. Uh, but just, yeah, uh, you might also use it to help you outline uh, and prepare the actual content. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good one. Uh, we've played uh, and we've used uh, for Dex and, and other stuff. We've also used Gamma um, and we've used Tome. And I think, you know, there's some others out there, but I would just say, you know, a, a lot of these, once again, as we alluded to earlier, a lot of this is just like, these are tools. I, I tell people all the time, you know, a shovel is a shovel. If you don't know how to dig, then, you know, it's not going to help you kind of thing. Right. So uh, I do love like, there's probably some tools that are better than others in this space, but I'd just say find a tool and learn how to use it really well. Um, you know, even uh, uh, you know, Gamma has been one that I've used a lot, and it's great. And I keep using it because I know how to use it. Um, and there might be better stuff. Like Beautiful might be way better, but I don't, I don't know. Um, so yeah, definitely, uh, I would say find a tool to use and make good use of it. <laughs> um, uh, I think uh, these other two questions don't seem uh, like questions, but if they are, please, uh, please clarify. Um, uh, here's a good one. Are there AI tools out there that help identify government grants and contracts for disabled veteran -owned businesses and then assist in the application process? Um, well, uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so this is a great question. I, you know, I want to stress at least for us at Open Grants that we are uh, vertical and technology agnostic. You know, if you happen to be a veteran-owned business or you happen to be just a small business or you're a technology startup or you're a nonprofit, any of those, you know, we really do serve everybody. So you can come, you can create a profile for free. We'll help identify the grants and then we'll help um, we'll help connect you to technical assistants and grant writers and folks who can help you actually build the application and submit it. And I believe Pioneer is, is much the same, but Nico, feel free to clarify a bit. Uh, yeah, it's not it's not our focus right now. So we want to make sure that in the areas that we focus okay. on, we can provide most value. So we haven't actually uh, done that. But if if one of our uh, businesses that we work with happens to be that, then we would do an extra step and to look into that as well. Awesome, very cool. And I think that dovetails. Uh, there's another question here: is you know, is Pioneer for government funding only? I believe that's what you're focused on solely, but- um... uh, We also have been supporting customers with basically all their 
funding round that we already helped the customer win was the Caltech Rocket Fund, which is non-governmental. And so uh, we've also helped companies apply for various corporate applications as well. Awesome. Very cool. That's really good to know and, and neat to hear. Um, well, I, you know, we are closing in on the, the last 10 minutes here. Um, and I did want to get into a bit of a discussion with you about, you know, more about just the uh, the current kind of vibes around AI <laughs> um, and get your thoughts on that. Um, you know, in these last 10 minutes, please do feel free. Um, you know, thank you all for coming to the webinar. Feel free to, to uh, dive in with more questions if something comes up for you. Um, and hopefully we've answered a lot of your questions here. Um, but, you know, there is a lot of just kind of speculation, hand wringing and other things about AI. And, you know, I, I recently went on a trip and one of my buddies was like, you guys are the problem. You, you're you're going to end the world with this thing. Um, I just wanted to get your thoughts, you know, um, how much of how much of that apprehension and panic do you feel like is is warranted? How much, you know, how real is it that like we're, we just built Skynet, right? Like, you know, some people have had those kinds of reactions. What do you what do you think about the future? Like, what's the next 10 years look like for AI? And mm -hmm. should we be worried? Should we be doing something? Um, or should we just like keep building stuff and see what happens? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, people are going to keep building stuff and see what happens. Some some people are going to do that regardless, right? So uh, with every technology, I think there's like some dangers that are going to come up and AI is no exception. You know, it's in like, uh, for example, social media, great for uh, posting photos, but then a lot of misinformation and document addiction to happen. Uh, NSA, the internet, a lot of NSA to spy on all of us more effectively. Uh, crypto allows a lot of Ponzi schemes. Uh, a lot of biological research, you know, can cause viruses to escape or whatever. Uh, pandemics can happen, We just increases the, the existential risks, right? And with AI, one of the existential risks that's been touted up was um, artificial general intelligence. And we've seen uh, Terminator and Skynet movies and The Matrix, uh, some of my favorite movies. Uh, <laughs> that, that's like a really uh, big theme. And yeah, people are afraid of artificial general intelligence and talking about is it going to be aligned with our interest? Um, and I think one of the biggest dangers that I see is actually even way before we reach the point where AI is like self-sufficient and autonomous and is able to like create Skynet or anything like that. I think people plus AI is always like more effective of either of those alone, um, both for good purposes, which is what we're trying to give a good example of Pioneer, but also for nefarious purposes. And so actually I'll be much more worried about how bad, bad actors would use that AI and tools and, um, you know, increasing misinformation powers uh, much more than, for example, Skynet um, narrative and, you know, communication challenges. I think there are opportunities for a lot of those models to actually hack us on emotional level and subconscious level, which we don't talk about a lot about, but I think those would be used by people that. Uh, are also very skilled in understanding those dynamics. So that is what I worry is going to happen much more before, um, you know, full on Skynet. I think reality is always much more interesting than the movies. Um, but I think just us always being careful the way I would say the best way for us to protect against it is to actually educate most of us about it and know about the dangers. Just like we saw with social media and misinformation, the more people are aware that this thing happens, they know to like check sources. Um, and with deep fakes that are, and a lot more things are gonna be deep faked uh, with AI. And I'm already seeing that with some of the applicants for the jobs that we're posting. Uh, I've seen several of them post like a very similar kind of cover letter. And I, I could see that it's it's assisted and um, it doesn't disqualify people, but it just becomes an arms race between various communication strategies. So uh, I think the best we can do is just get familiar uh, all of us start playing with the tools and understand the capabilities, understand what they're good at, what they're not yet good at, and uh, just stay stay current-ish. Yeah, I love that. I do think, you know, uh, it is probably a long time before we get to to Skynet, but certainly, you know, we can see it already in, in scams and, and things that people are running where, um, you know, you have these, you know, interesting capabilities to spoof people's anything from people's voices to their likeness um and, and do a lot of uh do a lot of potentially de nefarious and damaging things yeah um, yeah i i think 
you know, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, I, I wanted to just add a little bit of a positive note there as well, because it's that's the perceived dangers and we as species are always more uh, biased towards like fear and excitement. But I think there's like a lot of great stuff to look at. Like, for example, um, as an innovation platform, I see large language models as being even bigger than the iPhone was with creating apps and stuff. So I think that's actually going to infuse in a lot of the uh, systems and products that we use uh, and it's going to make life a lot better in various uh, different ways. And also, I expect like 10 years ago, like I said, uh, neural networks were considered a failed approach. Who knows, in 10 years, we're going to have several iterations after the current large language models. And I think that's going to be interesting to see what are the new paradigms. Uh, we don't really know because like if we knew, we'll just invent them right away. Uh, but future will, future will show. And then, um, yeah, I think that's going to enhance human creativity. And especially in this uh, domain, I'll, I'm just like excited to see uh, what kind of creativity we can unlock. Yeah, no, I'm I'm super excited. I, I alluded to this earlier, but, you know, one of the challenges that we've seen frequently is that folks just don't have the bandwidth uh, to write these applications, put them in, get them through the process. Um, and they often don't have the resources to get support uh, to do that either. Um, and I think one of the really exciting things for me about this space is that, you know, these are the kind of tools, um, you know, that can really help, you know, streamline that and remove those barriers for people. And I, you know, I've been a big fan of like no code for, uh, you know, as, as that movement has kind of pushed along um, and watching just this uh, take that to a whole new level where people can, you know, build apps and learn mm -hmm. things and just move ahead with their ideas and un unlocking human potential in a really more of a democratic way um, is super exciting. So, yeah, I think, uh, you know, there's a lot of things to obviously be wary of, but there's a lot of stuff to be excited about as well. And uh, I think that that's really fun. Um, I'm, you know, we're, we're closing in on the, the end of our time here. Um, and so I just want to say thank you to everyone who came out. Um, hopefully we did answer your questions. Uh, if you have more, please do send them our way. Um, once again, you know, uh, I think there's a lot of cool opportunities here to unpack for folks who are looking for grant funding or looking to streamline some of their workflows. Um, I will have, uh, you know, Miko send around some links. We'll send out an email. This recording will also be posted up in YouTube so you can get at it later. Um, and yeah, just thank you all. I'm going to turn it over to Miko for any kind of like last calls to action, uh, parting thoughts that you might have. But thank you so much uh, for joining us and for sharing your expertise. Really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, just, you know, take it away. Thank you for, uh, thank you, Sidel, for hosting today. Thank you, everyone, for, uh, you know, your time today as well. Or if you're watching this later down the road, thank you. Thank you for watching it as well. So. I have just two call to action. One is just the generic, uh, let's all uh, help address climate change together. And especially in, in the domain of funding, the government can increase the money printer and can go burn much faster, but making those resources being utilized effectively depends on how much all of us are putting uh, into it. And so just getting, rolling your sleeves and trying new tools and uh, doing something in that domain just being the man, the proverbial man or woman in the arena. Uh, I always want to support people like that. And I want to invite you uh, to, you know, come and join in solving one of the biggest challenges of our days. Um, and then the other thing about Pioneer specifically, we are actively hiring for operations and um, engineering. So if you want to see at pioneerclimate.com, we have also a waitlist if any of you would want to uh, use our services, but pioneerclimate.com slash careers is where you can see uh, our job opportunities so thank you awesome well thank you all really appreciate you all being here today um and uh definitely you can head over to to open grants as well um if you pop onto eventbrite and just follow us uh, we do have an awesome session coming up next month with the environmental protection network super cool they've helped a variety of startups on our platform uh secure epa uh, sbir um, they're fully funded by the federal government. So they're great people to know because they can offer some incredible no-cost services to you. Um, and uh, yeah, super excited to have you all here. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I'll let you all get back to your day and uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks. Cheers.